va a comenzar, vamos a comenzar con unas preguntas un poco para entrar en, en tono con, con la microbiosis cardíaca. Bueno, esta es una pregunta sobre un poco para ver la, la población, la especialidad, 60% de cardiología, hay un 25% de residentes y un 6% de otros. Bien. La actividad laboral, HPR, otra institución. Lo va cambiando. La gran mayoría viene del Hospital Privado de Rosario. Hay un 14% que son de fuera de Rosario. 18% fuera de Rosario. Esto es una pregunta. ¿Cuántos tipos de amiloidosis tienen repercusión a nivel cardíaco? Bueno, 77%. Dijeron que hay dos. Bien. ¿Qué porcentaje de los pacientes que ingresan con insuficiencia cardíaca o tienen insuficiencia cardíaca con función preservada y se constata una espesor parietal mayor de 12 tienen amiloidosis por transtirretina? Bien, está bastante afinado el público. Se ve que estuvo leyendo, Carlitos. Sí, están preparados. Bien. <risa> ¿Qué porcentaje de los pacientes con estenosis valvular óptica se ve evaluados para tal y tienen amiloidosis? Bien. La mayoría dice 80, entre 10 y 16%. ¿Y cuál es la, edad, la, la, la media de retraso del comienzo de los síntomas del diagnóstico en general de esta enfermedad? Bueno, la mayoría votó que la media de retraso de diagnóstico son cuatro años. Bien. Bueno, eh, vamos a seguir un poco la, la presentación eh, en inglés, un poco lo, por los invitados. Ya se estaba conectando Mace Hanna, esperamos dos minutos. Ahí está, ¿no? Ahí está. You, you have to turn on the microphone. Buenos días. Buenos días. How are you? Ah, uh, bien y tú? Bien. Okay. It's getting cold here. It's getting cold? Yes, cold. You mean hot? No, 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 cold. <laughs> Sorry about the delay. Mace, I want to present Mace, and Mace, I want to present you Mace. What's that? I want you to present James Moon. I don't know if you know James. Oh, Dr. yeah, Hi, how you doing? Heard a lot about you, sir. Yeah, thank Hi, you. Hi, Mace, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you. So we are going to start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the cardiology seminar here at the private hospital in Rosario. I'm going to coordinate this seminar with my colleague Juan Bonelli. He's the head of, head of the cardiovascular department at the Gamma Group. Today's topic is about amyloidosis. This is very exciting because amyloid was considered a rare disease when we studied in medical books. And nowadays, with the aging of the population and the better recognition of the disease, we, we challenge with the 
an acute diagnosis in order to start with specific treatments. We have the, pre the, the pleasure to have today two international world leaders, guests, James Moon is the chief of the cardiovascular imaging at the Bulk Hospital in, in London. And Mace Hanna is staff of the heart failure and transplant unit and director of the amyloid program in, at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Along with them, we are accompanied by local expert Juan Pablo Costabel from the Cardiovascular Institute in Buenos Aires, Alejandro Quiroga from the Favorola Foundation, and Federico Landeta from Centro Medico Mar del Plata. Uh, initially, uh, we are going to discuss a clinical case in order to get into the topic. Diego Freite, who is part of the cardiovascular imaging department, is going to present. Ben Mays is going to, to discuss about the diagnostic workup and current treatments. And later on, James Moon is going to give us an overview about the usefulness and the potential of MRI in the diagnosing and restatification of this disease. I want to thank the, the teaching and the, the research and marketing group at the Gamma Group uh, and Pfizer for the support in this, in, the, in, the, in carrying out this activity. So we are going to start with the clinical case and then we are moving on all together. Can, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Let's go on. Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar. So as Carlos said, we're gonna be we're gonna be starting with a clinical case. So this is a 78-year-old white male with average weight, average height, with a normal BMI of 24. So his chief complaint was of dyspnea. This is a man with a history of controlled hypertension and dyslipidemia. He presented to the cardiology outpatient clinic with a one month progressive dyspnea on exertion, so class two, three dyspnea. He also referred leg swelling and fatigue in the past month. So besides the hypertension and dyslipidemia, he had no relevant family history. No, pardon, no se ve la presentación, eh? That's right, we're not seeing the presentation. Can you see it there? Not yet. Sorry about that. Diego. Can you see the screen at all? Pueden ver la pantalla. Sí, la pantalla se ve, chicos. Dale de vuelta porque se colgó cuando lo abrían. ¿Sabes lo que pasa, Diego? Me parece que porque Zoom te deja elegir a veces qué pantalla estás compartiendo. Y están claro. compartiendo la carpeta, de, la carpeta del escritorio y no la presentación. Fíjate, si, si apretan en compartir pantalla te va a dejar elegir múltiples pantallas y ahí volvé a elegir la presentación. Creo que ese es el problema. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahora sí. Perfecto. Sí, ahí está perfecto. Sí, perfecto. Bueno, gracias, Seba. ¿Cómo salió? Sí, claro, sí. Fíjate ahí no pasa nada. Ok. So, um, 
as I said, um, his past medical history, he had hypertension, control of hypertension and dyslipidemia, no relevant family history. Uh, he also had glaucoma, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, and a surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome two years prior. He was currently on losartan, simvastatin, aspirin, and pamsulacin. On physical examination, he had normal heart rate and normal blood pressure, and clear signs of heart failure, which are highlighted here, four to six jugular venous distension with partial collapse, a grade two systolic murmur at the apex, a pattern of jugular reflux, bivasal rallies, and two plus edema past the ankle. The rest was quite unremarkable. So as an initial workup, the patient received an EKG, CBC and chem panel, and an echocardiogram. So starting with this electrocardiogram, we see a normal sinus rhythm with a heart rate of around 80 beats per minute. He showed some signs of uh, left atrial enlargement the rest was quite, quite normal. There were no signs of LV hypertrophy. And this lab test, we see so, uh, signs of altered renal function, a DUN of 73, creatinine of 1.7, and an estimated GFR of 40. The rest was, was normal. Sorry about that. So this is his echocardiogram. As you can see, he has a mildly dilated left ventricle with an internal di uh, diastolic diameter of around 61 millimeters. He had an EF of 42% with global hypokinesia. As you can see, he has a concentric hypertrophy. The wall thickness uh, in most walls was around 13, 14 millimeters, but he had a maximal wall thickness of around 19 millimeters in the posterior basal septum. Uh, he also had a moderately enlarged left atrium and mildly enlarged right atrium. On Doppler study, we can see a mild MR, mild aortic insufficiency, signs of grade two, three diastolic dysfunction with elevated uh, filling pressures, and also an elevated systolic pulmonary artery pressure of 60 millimeters of pressure. So this is his strain analysis. We can see a GLS of minus 10.5, which is significantly reduced. And in the bullseye, we have, uh, we have what uh, you can see here is a apical sparing, so a relative apical sparing, and an apical to base ratio of 1.6. We also had an EF to GLS ratio of four. So in this patient with symptoms and signs of heart failure, a dilated cardiomyopathy, low ejection fraction, unexplained hypertrophy, and altered renal function. So how, how would you study this patient? I don't know, Carlos, if for time I should go on or... I want to ask Alejandro and Juan Pablo, do you have any comment on this case? Do you want to ask something to James or, or, or Mace? Uh, well, uh, right off the bat, I mean, I I think I would start up with this hypertensive elderly male uh, with dyslipemia assessing uh, first the coronaries. I mean, he has uh, abnormal wall motions. The EKG ha uh, has uh, quite a bit of an R on V2 with a progressive decrease of Rs uh, towards the lateral uh, leads so you can't just uh throw away that diagnosis i mean he does have a, quite a bit of uh, lvh on echo and as diego said the ef uh, sr is quite uh categorical i don't know about juan pablo pablo eh, carlos vamos vamos en inglés o en, espa o en español ¿Qué te parece As you want, como quiera, Juan. Eh, no, digo, eh, com comparto lo que dijo Alejandro. Eh, es, es difícil, porque estamos en un caso clínico y estamos hablando de amiloidosis, así que eh, no, no sesgarse por eso. Este, 
entiendo que lo más común es la cardiopatía isquémica, eh, si sí hay algunas cuestiones que no cierran para cardiopatía isquémica para explicar lo que tiene, o sea, tiene una hipertrofia que es desmesurada para el electrocardiograma que tiene, eh, o sea, que no, no se explica por eso, el, la motilidad no es la motilidad de una cardiopatía isquémica, o sea, esa cuestión como global, sin segmentariedad, el electrocardiograma no es de cardiopatía isquémica, así que entiendo y comparto lo que dijo Ale 100%, pero me parece que yo pensaría en otra forma de cardiopatía. Si pienso en otra forma de cardiopatía, después ahí, en términos generales, lo, lo que nosotros hacemos es ver cuál es nuestra, nuestra sospecha principal. Si nuestra sospecha principal puede ser miocardiopatía hipertrófica, miocardiopatía infiltrativa distinta de amiloidosis, vamos primero a hacer una iría primero a hacer una resonancia cardíaca. Si mi sospecha principal es amiloidosis cardíaca, viendo todo esto, sumando cosas, iría directamente, el paciente se va con un pedido de centellograma y unas cadenas livianas eh, a su casa. Y, y en base a eso después sigo. Perfecto. Mais, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ok, we are, we are all agreed that with this clinical feature we have to rule out coronary artery disease at first and then we can move on y try to explain how or why the, the LV is so hypertrophic. So let's let's go on. Do you agree? Uh yeah. I, I, I don't know if I would have jumped to a coronary angiogram personally, but um I it's uh, I agree. Okay. So as was said, uh, we, we first ruled out coronary artery disease with a cardiac angiogram showed non-obstructive CAD, and then went on to do a cardiac MRI. Uh, okay. okay, hi, dear colleagues, how are you? Okay, here we can see four chamber and short axis thin images where we can see left ventricular hypertrophy with the maximum thickness at 21 millimeter in the inferior septal wall. The left ventricular volumes were increased, look at, look at there, with slightly systolic dysfunction. Okay. Uh, and there is a, a large left atrium enlargement, and there, <coughs> CMR imaging demonstrates the characteristic pattern of global subendocardial debated heart. The other one, two, so, we can do T1 mapping and we, we, and we have sequences and we can detect diffuse fibrosis. Look the, look the number, 1,309 milliseconds. The normal value is until 100 milliseconds. 1,000 milliseconds, sorry. And, the, and finally, the value of extra cellular volume is also increased to 44%. Okay, so we conclude that the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype could be corresponding to cardiac amyloidosis. So Federico, you are an expert in MRI. Do you want to say something about this or discuss something with James? Okay, that is a really nice case. Thank you very much. Uh, I would agree with Juan Pablo and with Mace. Maybe uh, I wouldn't have uh, asked for a coronary angiogram. Uh, of course, there's a little bias because we are talking about myelodosis and I do see MR, but we can see it as a 78 year old patient with 15 or 16 millimeters with only losartan. I, I mean, only one drug uh, for his hypertension. Mm, I would have done, uh, I think, direct the CMR. In the CMR, we can see that there is an eccentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. We can also uh, see previous on the echo that tissue uh, um, the velocities, tissue doppler imaging were really, really slow. That talks a lot about uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And on the CMR, I am not sure if I should talk about T1 mapping because all that I know about this subject, I learned it from papers written by James, but we can see that's uh, quite interesting why um, that this technique, we can do the 
differential diagnosis with fibroid disease. That is really, really nice. Fibroid disease, they usually have shorter uh, native T1s values and with uh, smaller uh, EC or with normal extracellular volume. Whereas in cardiac amyloidosis, we have longer uh, native T1 values and with larger ECVs. Uh, am I right, James? Yes, in, yes, indeed, of course you are. I, I, I would add to the pictures that um, this is quite asymmetric. And as soon as you're thinking about amyloid, I was struck by the lack of pericardial and pleural effusions for LV impairment. And to me, this, this was, and the other thing about it was that once you're into 20 millimeter wall thickness, you're starting to not be very like AL. So I was beginning to move quite quickly towards TTR here. Very thick heart, impairment without overt heart failure on presentation. If this was an AL, there would have been, this person would have been sicker with that EF. James, can I ask a question to James? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the mild dilatation in the volumes and, and, and the LV dimensions. Um, you know, we always talk about how the, the dimensions are normal or even smaller in cardiac amyloid, but I have actually seen them. I have seen phenotypes where they're mildly dilated. Um, I was just wondering what your experience with that is. So especially in AL, I think, where yeah. maybe the deposition can outrun the ability of the heart to compensate. I think you can get an almost a DCM appearance. I think TTR is typically a slower disease and you're seeing both the pathology and an adaption to it. Nevertheless, the dilatation here, I think was slightly unusual and it made me think maybe they'd had some MR or uh, we haven't seen, you know, uh, it, it's slightly unusual to have that. Um, whether TTR is a disease of elderly men and it co-segregates with other diseases. So, there may well be a, a degree of hypertensive heart disease as well. Um, and I'm sure we're going to come to a definitive com uh, combination of tests for this patient in a minute with bone scintigraphy and free light chain exclusion, I suspect. Okay, I have a question for Mace. Mace, would yeah. the, with the picture that we had before the MRI, was enough to jump directly from the clinical data to nuclear imaging and, and, and blood samples, or do you think MRI in this particular case was important? Okay, that's a charged question with James Moon on the line here. But um, I, my personal opinion is, uh, first of all, I think MRI is a fantastic tool as far as giving you prognostic and diagnostic information. But I think if, one, if your suspicion is high that it's cardiac amyloid, if you're, if you're like, this is the diagnosis I'm going for, then I don't think it's unreasonable to say, okay, that's what I'm going for. I'm gonna do the DPD or PYP, depending on where you are, and the appropriate lab testing for AL to try to arrive at the diagnosis. And when you see this elderly gentleman in his mid seventies, presumably Caucasian with carpal tunnel syndrome, unexplained LVH with what I call relative low voltage. So the voltage isn't low, but it's kind of on the normal range. So it, you, when you put that all together, um, and we all did not think this was hypertensive heart disease or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and, and you look at the echo, you just say, okay, look, this is cardiac amyloidosis until proven otherwise. And I'm gonna do a, let's say you do a DPD and you do the, the light chains and the immunofixation, and the DPD lights up, you know, like a Christmas tree and the, all the light chains are negative. There's no M protein, which you, you would hope. To, and then you, you, you would technically be done. So um, without the need to go through an MRI, I, I, um, I still think the MRI though helps you, you know, deal with other diseases as well. So that's the advantage of doing it. But I think you could slice it either way, personally. Um, I'm wondering what James thinks. Yeah, I, I think I think you could. I mean, he isn't he isn't very elderly. He's not over eighty. The carpal tunnel is not rare, and it depends how you're feeling. If you're really picking up on that, it's a big red flag. Um, uh, and of course, 
going for the emgus quite a lot of people will have a monoclonal gammopathy um, <coughs> and then you still have this grade one and here i think we should be highlighting the potential difference between amyloid dosis where the amyloid is causing disease and dual pathology with a bit of amyloid especially the grade ones um, I like MRI, but I think bone scintigraphy is, is a really good test if it's if it's it should be easily available as well because it's a simple test to do. Okay. Carlos, may I jump in and ask something right uh, before we move on? James and Federico. I'd like to know kind of what happens like in this patient uh, who has a creatinine of 1.7. How do you manage contrast uh, with uh, Imaging. So um, I'm, um, I, I work in mils per minute. So um, I'm we around we forty. Only, okay, so I'm not concerned at all um, above thirty mils per minute because the new cyclic, well, the removal of linear chelators onto gadolinium has stopped the disease NSF and also the brain deposition. It's only those collating agents where the gadolinium could become free that was a problem. So I'm, I'm really not concerned about usual dose gadolinium um, in somebody with an EGFR um, greater than 30. And below 30, if, the, if it really matters, oh, we will use it quite a lot. Okay, that's good enough. Uh, James, I have a question, do, do you use no protein bond gadolinium in order to improve the diagnostic accuracy when you perform this? Yes, so, um, so if you want to, for example, do the extracellular volume technique, what you're using the contrast agent as is as a tracer, and a tracer must not be bound or metabolized or filtered, it just partitions. So it mustn't be protein bound. The ECV technique could have, for example, had you done a CT here, been added to that as well. So you can use iodine to do ECV as well. And we're starting to do that in our TAVI workup patients. And a high ECV in those can be quite suspicious for TTR. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're going to move on. So as we said, we went on with specific labs, the zero monoclonal protein study, light chain typing was normal, kappa lambda ratio of two was normal with the renal impairment, and the immunofixation serum and urine. Okay. So maize, that's enough to rule out AL amyloid? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's this whole controversy over the kappa lambda ratio um, you know, in renal impairment, you know, what's a cutoff that's reasonable? Uh, you know, there, there, there is a paper showing that in the more advanced the renal insufficiency, the more that, so normally you would think that the light chains, both kappa and lambda are renally excreted. So you would assume that in renal insufficiency, they would both go up proportionally. But what happens, and I'm not going to go into the explanation just in the interest of time, is that you tend to get kappa going up more than lambda in renal insufficiency. So it's natural with, you know, let's say a GFR of 30 to see a ratio that may be a little more elevated than the upper limit of normal, which in our lab is 1.65. So here, a, a, an upper, a, a ratio of two with a GFR of 40 doesn't, imply, doesn't necessarily mean there's clonality or there's a clonal process. It's just a matter of um, you know, the, the excretion of the, the kappa versus the lambda. So this parentheses where you stay up to 3.1 with renal impairment, um, you know, when we wrote that paper, Jack, we, there was a lot of discussion back and forth about, oh, are we, you know, are we being uh, cavalier or is that too high? Are we going to miss something? But I think in th this particular, uh, these particular lab values, yes, I feel very comfortable you know, ignoring that the ratio of two is mildly elevated and just saying this is not AL. I don't know what James thinks, but that's, that would be my interpretation of that. Okay. And last of all, uh, the patient received the technetium pyrophosphate scintigraphy. We see here a, a clear, a significant cardiac uptake with the grade three in the perigenic scale. 
and the cardiac to mean is final ratio of 1.5. So, uh, Alejandro or Juan Pablo, do you have to ask something about this? Juan tenía un comentario, me parece. No, yo, yo lo que iba a decir es, como mirando la perspectiva del paciente Carlos, era, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué hubiese pasado si nosotros empezábamos estudiando las coronarias y nos encontrábamos con la enfermedad coronaria? O sea, si we start with the coronary angiography and we found um, lesions, um, the, the problem for the patient would have been assuming that all the problem was uh, coronary heart disease. So that's why I, I think that it doesn't matter really in which way we start. The, the, the objective for us, for, for the cardiologist, is to, to see what's happening with the patient. The patient might have uh, coronary problems and amyloidosis problems. We, we, we have follow up uh, over 60 patients with cardiac amyloidosis and one third of them had coronary angiography and, and, and coronary lesions. And that's one of the problems why this patient takes so long to make diagnosis, because you said, oh, we, we found an LAD lesion, that was the problem, and the patient goes, goes bad, and, and, and then you, you, you don't uh, go deep in your in work up. In your work up. Uh, now, coming back to, the, to, the, to this situation, I think that if we have this uh, centrography and uh, those low levels of, of light change, I, I think that it, it's enough to say that uh, there's a high probability of, of being talking about the TTR cardiomyopathy. Okay, uh, that's, yeah, that's I agree. Uh, I, I agree completely. The next, next step with this patient would, would be performing a, a genetic test to see if we are talking about a hereditary form or a wild type. So, Mays? Yes. So, this is, um, we have here PAMI. PAMI is like the Medicare in the US. So, we have only this planar uh, nuclear imaging. Do you think that SPEC is very important here or particularly in the patient with uh, kidney impairment? You know, I, I think that um, obviously the desire to have SPEC is to make sure that you're ensuring that the uptake is not in the blood pool, rather it's in the myocardium, okay? And so you're worried about false positives. I think that if you're in a place that doesn't have SPECT, we use SPECT CT actually, SPECT CT, and I'll show you some examples. Um, I, you know, in this case where the, the pretest likelihood is high and you have grade three uptake and you know, the, the, the likelihood of a false positive is quite low and you put a gun to my head and say, hey, I don't have SPECT or SPECT CT and I need to make a diagnosis here at the gamma group and I need to, I want to decide whether to start this patient on tefamidus or something. I say, yeah, I, I think that's, I think this, I, I wouldn't feel like this was a false positive, but to be honest and, and to be a purist, I would say yes, because, you know, there, there, we've seen many cases of false positives, particularly people with low cardiac output where the tracer accumulates in the myocardium. So I, I guess the answer is yes, I would have loved to have SPECT or SPECT-CT actually, but um, in this particular case, I feel comfortable with the diagnosis. Okay. So last of all, we're, we're gonna go through this uh, quickly through this flow chart. So we had a patient with uh, signs of heart failure an echocardiogram and, an, and a CMR that were suggestive of cardiac amyloid. So uh, as in this patient, a bone scintigraphy was done, which showed a grade three uh, cardiac <laughs> uptake. Uh, the serum immunofixation urine and the serum light free chain and monoclonal proteins were all negative, were all normal. So this would point us to cardiac uh, ATTR and amyloid. And what would, what, would be, what would be left would be to genotype the patient to see if it's wild type or, or, or hereditary. So that's it. Great. So, so I, I, I will stop here in order to give uh, the turn of Mace in order to give your talk. Mace, is okay? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to share my screen? Yes.
Uh, you have to enable me. Uh, it says host has to allow me to share my screen. A great case. In the meanwhile, may I ask May something? Sure. May, uh, I don't know. If, uh, what do you think about uh, thinking about something else, uh, given the renal uh, function uh, in this patient and that uh, flaring up in the scan of the kidneys? Should we think something else, APOE1, for instance? I don't think so because you know when when you do these uh, PYP scans, mm -hmm. we we see uh, kidney uptake, and I believe it's the tracer, um, you know, getting excreted. Um, I don't think it represents. And again, I I get to qualify the statement with I'm not 100 percent sure, but I don't think it I don't think it represents, you know, kidney amyloid so to speak. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's my take on it. Okay. And one, uh, are you, do you have your screen ready to share or may I oh, ask you something let, else? Uh, let me just see if he's, yeah, I can no, just check that. Yeah. You could ask me while I'm doing it. Let me see your desktop. No, one thing that we actually get, uh, here is, um, the free light assay. Um, Every uh, laboratory here uh, has their different cutoff points for kappa and lambda, and that sometimes adds an uncertainty to the diagnosis uh, when it's sometimes hard as it is. Uh, should, does that matter that each uh, laboratory has different cutoff points? For instance, this case, if you actually turn the values into uh, milligrams per liter, it would give like, uh, I don't know, 600, I think it was the value. Uh, no, even more, Th that times 100, I think it, it would have ended up being. But for the lab laboratory assessment, that's the normal range. Is that okay or are we missing things? No, I mean, I, I, I think as far as the light chains are concerned, there's two main assays. There's the free light assay and then there, I can't remember the other one's name, but they each have their own uh, reference ranges. We use the free light assay, and I think it depends on your lab. But I, this, um, by the way, I'm having problems sharing my screen. I don't know what Zoom is asking me, like all these different permission things and firewalls and all this stuff that I can't figure out. So um, I may have to just talk if I can't figure this out. But um, th that being, as far as the light chain issue, I think that is the number one confusing issue. Um, and I really wanted to bring it up in that paper because, you know, in practice, we all say, oh, order the serum free light chain and the immunofixation serum urine and, and get the PYP in the, but a good 20% of the time, if not more, you have some abnormality there to deal with um, that you're not like, oh, wait a minute, do I need to biopsy this patient? Okay. And so the, 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 there's cases where it's clear. I mean, the, the lambda is high, the kappa is low. Or you have an M protein, and it's 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 not it's not gray, but there's a lot of them where, like you said, you're wondering: is this the assay? Is this my lab? Where it's mildly abnormal, right? Where the kappa, either the kappa, I've seen multiple cases where the kappa lambda ratio is completely normal, and the absolute levels are normal, yet the patient has a kappa M protein. They're 80 years old. They have a grade for DPD scan, let's say. I mean, just in your face, okay? They've got carpal tunnel, biceps tendon rupture. Everything looks like TTR. And then you have this isolated kappa M protein, IgG kappa M protein on the immunization, let's say, with normal free light chain levels. Now, what do you do? People call me all the time. Hey, look, this, is, this guy's 80. I don't wanna biopsy him. This is TTR, but I have this M protein now. What do I do? So the answer on this side is, well, to be a purist, you know, there's an M protein and we keep writing these papers and saying, you have
have to rule out AL. This still could be L. How can you have AL amyloidosis causing a wall thing 1.8 with normal kappa lambda? Um, so, but so what we do in those scenarios, when you know the 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 typical teaching is if you have an M protein, well that's that's clonality um, versus a mildly elevated kappa lambda ratio. So you've got a biopsy, and we will biopsy in those scenarios, even though I'm biopsying and I know that, that what I'm getting is TTR, but with the, the mildly elevated kappa lambda ratio that you bring up, um, that is the number one problem that, that we, we deal with it just like you deal with it. And what we do is we look at the renal function, we look at the big picture, and we talk with our hematologist. And like in this case where the, the ratio was two, I personally would feel comfortable, but I would tell people who are not doing this every day to talk to their hematologist and make sure they say, okay, that's, that's fine. That's nothing. That's renal insufficiency. Because the number one concern is if you keep creeping, maybe you miss AL one day and you never want to miss AL. So that's a long winded answer. And I'm making a long winded because I can't share my screen. So, right, um, right, right now. What? Right, right now. Try again. Okay. We, we... Oh, okay. Yeah, here we go. So uh, it says portion of the screen open system. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Open system preferences, security, privacy, grant access. Oh, I see. So go to privacy, and where do you grant access to Zoom? I'm trying to do this. Oh, here we go. Zoom will not able be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. Oh, boy. Uh, I, it's making me leave the meeting. Maybe, maybe James can start. Okay. Do you want to start? Try now, please. Who, me? Um. James, do you want to start? Yeah, well, let's see if it works for me. Okay. Except that's not the slide I want, sorry. <laughs> okay. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, so we're just going to talk about cardiac MRI now. So we've alluded to all the different differentials of heart muscle disease with hypertrophy, especially in the elderly. And it's not the simple clean list of genetic cardiomyopathy. There's lots of mimics and changes associated with aging, of course, and much a lot of multi multifactorial disease. Um, Amyloid does a lot to the heart. Amyloid must be very benign because half your heart by weight or more can be amyloid and yet you're not, you're still alive. Um, so there's a lot we can see and measure and stratify with it. You can see here the entire septum on this um, heart is amyloid. Um, and we haven't got into it completely, but the patterns are different between TTR and AL, the two amyloids that impact the ventricular myocardium. This is TTR with some immunostaining and there's some AR with almost complete replacement. Um, and a lot of cardiology is based on structure and function imaging, angiography, echo, and we know the pattern of advanced disease. We're all familiar with it. But very often, if we want our drugs to work, we need to see disease earlier um, and we need to be able to track changes over time, especially if we're thinking about expensive therapies, for example. Uh, we, we saw this uh, very characteristic appearance earlier with the apical sparing in some amyloid as well. Um, here is MRI. I don't know how well my movies are going, but this is advanced structure and function in cardiac amyloidosis. And you can see all the features, the concentric LVH here, uh, biatrial dilatation, reduced long axis, uh, including on the RV side. It's really obvious, um, but we want to try and pick it up earlier and work out if that hypertrophy is from amyloid or compensation and other diseases. The first technique that was really useful was scar imaging because the contrast agents that we're talking about linger in the extracellular space and amyloid gives a very characteristic pattern. Um, initially subendocardial, a bit more basal, and then becoming transmural later and extending from the base down to the apex. 
Um, the picture I showed you before was a very clean picture. Very often, actually, you get some artifact because the patients are breathless and they have pleural effusions. So in many ways, the pictures I'm now showing you are more typical of amyloid. You'll also see that the blood and the myocardium are sort of nulling together and that the late GAD is not particularly bright. And that's because the, if, you, if you coin the word myocrit, the gaps between the myocytes are approaching the gaps between the red cells. There's a lot of water in myocardium with amyloid. It's hugely infiltrated at times. Now, in the early days, five years ago um, and before, when everything is abnormal, the late GAD technique is a difference technique. You have to identify one tissue to make black and then it highlights abnormality elsewhere. But in amyloid, everything can be abnormal with this base to apex or endocardial to epigradient. And here, for example, is the same patient where the nulling has made it basal in one and apical in the other. We've got over that now uh, using the PSIR technique. And you see this very clean progression, regardless of what amyloid type, from no late GAD, subendocardial to transmural. Um, we see a lot more transmural in TTR, um, but that's not because AL doesn't do it. It's because once you have transmural GAD in AL, your prognosis is very short. So you just don't see it as much. So how can we go further and help target our therapies? Well, we've got a portfolio of techniques now to measure multiple parameters of the heart. And I'm gonna talk about the ECV and T1 and then a hint at T2 and showing what that might be doing. So when we measure a new parameter, we have a normal range and some diseases like Fabry's make your T1 short and amyloid makes the T1 long. A lot longer than most diseases. So the ECV, the extracellular, um, but clearly we want to detect earlier disease. So you need to look in between. Using the mapping, you can very quickly get your eye in to see the changes. And if I show you an AL here and a TTR, you're seeing that the TTR is thicker, but actually the T1 mapping changes are more profound in the AL. So there's something going on there. Uh, look at the late GADs as well. The TTR has got more late GAD, but the AL has got higher T1. Uh, Moving from anecdote to data, you can see that many diseases nudge up your T1 a little bit. Fabry's drops it down profoundly and AL increases it a lot. But the question is, is there a difference between being down here and up there? The T1 does go up early. So you can see patients in here with AL where the T1 is high when they are definitively by Mayer classification not having cardiac involvement. And what you have here in conventional terms is no cardiac involvement possible and definite. And once you start measuring new parameters like T1 ECV, you realize that the amyloidosis is a spectrum. And that over time, I think we'll be choosing, for example, chemotherapy regimes or for TTR specific approaches according to the burden of disease. Just looking here, you can get your iron quite quickly. So Carlos with his scanner can probably tell which ones are amyloid quite quickly. Um, these are low T1, there's a, a Fabry's there, a Fabry's there. Um, this is probably high T1, but very thin. So whilst that could be a DCM-like amyloid, it's a myocarditis. And you can see two here that I showed earlier. What about the T1 mapping? Um, so the, so native T1 goes up, and this is a different lookup table. You've got to be careful and always look at the lookup table. But if you give the contrast agent, and the contrast agent lingers in the gaps between cells uh, in the water, then you get a map, and our scanner now generates these maps on the scanner. And this is a relatively normal ECV, but if the myocardium had been red, then the ECV would be high. And the thing is for diffuse disease, it's a non-specific feature of water, but there aren't any diseases that give you more than 40% ECV globally uh, and, it, and, and have you still alive. You can't have that much global fibrosis. So if you have high ECVs, it can be pathognomonic practically for amyloid. 
Um, and here are the pictures, for example, the ECV here is moderately raised. I can just see that from the color. Uh, and here very raised, and the bottom one is a clear amyloid. And in fact, you can see the difference between the late GADs. This, the top one was mainly subendocardial, and the one below was becoming transmural. These funny measures are highly predictive. Any measure of cardiac involvement is prognostically adverse, but these, EC, these ECV measurements in particular can be more prognostic than other features. I was about to say more prognostic than the ejection fraction, but of course, as you know, the EF is relatively preserved in this disease. So perhaps other measures like GLS or stroke volume indexed are better um, structure function echo or MRI markers than just EF. Don't rely on the EF. Now, we think of this as a permanent change in the myocardium, but if you can turn off the process, these can reverse. So this is an AL patient over six months, and you don't see a great reversal of the hypertrophy. You can sometimes, but the, the late GAD has gone from transmural subendocardial to disappeared, and the ECV has fallen progressively. So therapy um, can really reverse this disease if you can get the patient to survive long enough to, to, to allow time. The amyloid is in an equilibrium and, and this can be reversed. And I think we'll be seeing a lot more of this over time as we start to understand it. It's, we really want treatment for our, our patients, but actually having the treatment is, is a good way of starting to understand the disease more as well. So this is the sort of process that we're now seeing over time, going from normal T1 ECV no late GAD, first the T1 and ECV goes up to say 30% there, and then you get the subendocardial and then transmural. And this stage doesn't is, is got a, a much worse survival, but the survival is getting progressively worse as well. What else do we see? These are newer signs, but um, this patient here with AL is, is, the myocardium is wet. It's very boggy, it's edema. And we're starting to realize that there's a lot going on in the myocardium with this insult of infiltration. Maybe the infiltration is slower in TTR, so adaption and myocyte hypertrophy can occur quick to compensate. But in AL, you get it, it is quite an, I suspect it's inflammatory. Edema doesn't necessarily mean inflammation, but it, I suspect it is. And you can start to see differences between treated and untreated patients and TTR and AL. Uh, higher TTR in everyone, but but responses as if there are different pathological processes occurring concurrently. Uh, and they are also associated with uh, outcome. So I'm not gonna show you too much about the applications because I suspect this will be covered in the other talk, but my preferred area for um, CMR and amyloid is either when you know there's amyloid and you want to see if there's involvement, especially early involvement, or if you know there's LVH and you want to know if it's amyloid. They're two typical high pretest probability scenarios. And the TTR is really better with the bone scintigraphy, but if there's AL, the CMR is really good. Of course, with hypertrophy, you see a lot more um, and you get much more insight into other diseases, phenocopies, genocopies, Fabry's, for example. Uh, so a really useful, I would, I would advocate an MRI for everyone with unexplained hypertrophy where other tests haven't given you a, a diagnosis, to be honest, at baseline. Um, I'm not going to go through these cases about grade, different grades and what we come, because that was well covered in the first case, so I'm going to move on. But suffice to say that non-invasive imaging is really taking its role here when linked to the exclusion uh, as discussed supply chains. So just to summarize there, we're really talking about unexplained LVH, and we've got to move on from this um, architecture-based structure and function approach to look at multi-parametric parameters of processes in the myocardium. CMR is useful because it's imaging that, um, but we need multiple different types. And we're trying to get to an understanding of processes in the myocardium, not just the presence or absence of amyloid, but a more nuanced understanding. And obviously it fits in with in a diagnostic pathway and not just do my test rather than your test, because it's nuanced about what you're trying to do and what you're going to get from the patient. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, James. I, I know you have to, to leave, you have another talk. I, I want May, if May, do you have any question for James Moon?
No, it was an uh, excellent talk and uh, very enlightening. Thank you, James, and it was nice to meet you. Thank you, Baze. Oh. I hope your screen's going to work. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm trying a different computer at the same time. So, so Fede, Fede, do you have any, any questions for James? Yes, I, may, I might have uh, some little questions, uh, James, if you have time. Really nice presentation. Thank you very much. I've, talk, I've, I've said I'm going to be five minutes late for the next meeting, so that's okay. Okay, thank you. What about, uh, what about uh, you said that if, if our patient would have had uh, AL, amyloidosis, the EF uh, would have been really, really worse. Uh, what about that? It's also described that patients with uh, similar wall thickness, uh, they have also worse strain values. What about this life chain hypothesis of toxicity? <clears throat> Yeah, so um, a lot of people explain how bad the heart is in how, how, how much heart failure some people have with AL in the face of a preserved EF as being about light chain toxicity. And I know there's evidence for that, but I think there's, I think an alternative explanation is that if you tip amyloid very quickly into the interstitium and if it accumulates fast, you get a worse phenotype because the heart can't compensate. So to my mind, thinking about the LVH you see on the ECG and TTR and not in AL, my instinct is that the evidence is supportive also of just the, the speed of the process. Um, I don't know, but to me, TTR slow, AL can be lightning fast. Okay. And um, the last question would be, what about the quantification of its burden? It's really, really tedious to do quantification by LGE. Do you, you showed us uh, uh, right now, do you think that maybe ECV would be the best way to uh, do the follow-up yeah. with these patients? Yeah, so the late GAD quantification really has to be non sub cardial transmural. And when you compare between times, you can sometimes get a bit more than that subjectively, but it's an imperfect semi-quantitative test, a bit like current bone scintigraphy. The ECV is better, um, uh, uh, but what you really want to see is everything going in the same direction, if you like. So you, you're trying to take a, a whole view. And of course, in in outside the context of acute, say, chemotherapy for AL, um, BMP should resolve as well, um, hopefully. Clearly, it can go in an opposite direction during acute therapy. What I'm interested to see, and I think we're starting to see it, is, is uh, regression in TTR as well. I think that's uh, something I'm really keen to see over the next few years. Yes, that was outstanding. Okay, okay thank you very thank much. You, James, very kind from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to go now, Carlos. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank yes. you. Okay, Mace. Bye. Bye, Mace. Bye, Mace. Okay, take care, James. Mace, uh, you're, you're in a TV studio. We have double of you here. Yeah, because I have my other computer. Can you let me try to share the screen? Can you uh, give me permission? Yes. Muy amable, señor. A ver. Uh, I'm gonna try it on my laptop. I'm gonna try it on my laptop. Let me see. Okay. Oh, here you go. Let's see. I think this might work. This might work. I, um. Okay. Do you see? Yeah, you see yeah. it now. Yeah. Right? You see it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, let me try to give it from my laptop then. Okay. So you see my screen, right? Yes. yes. Voy a hacer toda la lectura en español. No, 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 you're kidding. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. You would, that would be so painful for you. Um, so anyway, so the, the, what um, Carlos asked me to speak about is, uh, let me mute the other one here. Mace, you're muted. You're muted one of them. We can't hear you.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me get back to the, to the talk. Let me see if I can, okay, can you see the talk now? Yes. Okay, so I think yes, that- I, don't, don't worry, we have the, the whole morning for you. Oh, you do, okay, excellent. So the, um, the, um, the, the most important point to remember is that over 95% of the time, if you're dealing with cardiac amyloidosis, it's gonna be either AL or ATTR, okay? And we know that, um, you know, um, AL is a plasma cell dyscrasia coming from the bone marrow, and you have these light chain fragments um, depositing in the heart. And, and then ATTR, it's a liver-derived protein um, that's depositing in the heart, and it's either wild type or hereditary. I, this is probably too basic, but I just do want you to remember that there are these other rarer types of cardiac amyloid. Um, AA amyloidosis, it's not common to have cardiac involvement, but you can. Um, APOL A1, someone brought that up. That's a possibility. There's some other hereditary forms that can do it. But as a clinician and you're a cardiologist and you see unexplained LV thickening um, and you're worried about amyloid, you're really thinking about these two types. And you're, the diagnostic algorithm is basically um, predicated on those two types. Okay, so we have AL amyloidosis. I'm not gonna go into detail, but I think it's important to remember that the second most common or probably almost as common as heart involvement is the kidney. So anybody with HFPEF and proteinuria, I think you should always have a heightened sense of, could this be you know, AL amyloidosis? And remember that there is a phenotype, and James Moon referred to it, where your wall thickness actually can be near normal and you have some mild dilate, dilatation. So, you know, there, and there are papers showing that they, in some patients, particularly with AL, you can have very mildly, you can have very mildly elevated wall thickness or even near normal wall thickness. So remember that phenotype. Um, and then as far as TTR is concerned, you know, um, I, again, you, I, I'm probably, this is too basic, but there's over 100, there's 127 amino acid monomers and they come together as a tetramer. So, but these, each one of these are identical and it breaks apart and either affects typically the heart nerves or both, okay? And then the wild type form, the median age of diagnosis is 74. And the example that you presented, I, if I recall correctly, the guy was 74 years old. Classically white males, although can happen in females, we have African-Americans, but it's most commonly in a white male and they get conduction disease, AFib, and cardi and HFPEF. Although interestingly, the mean EF in the in the Tefamidus trial was forty eight percent, and plus or minus. So there's a lot of these people who have mid range or HFMRF mid range EF, um, and of course there are people who can have low EF. But um, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and spinal stenosis and biceps tendon rupture are not uncommon at all. And in fact, I would ask all your patients with HFPEF, we're thinking about administering a questionnaire. Have you ever had carpal tunnel syndrome? Both sides, have you ever had surgery? Have you ever had spinal stenosis? Have you ever had rupture of your biceps tendon in the past? And you'll find when you start asking these questions systematically, you will see it uh, more often. This is the most common type of amyloid. And then the hereditary type, there's been over 130 mutations and uh, autosomal dominant. And, you know, we used to talk about familial amyloid polyneuropathy and then separating it with familial amyloid cardiomyopathy. But the truth of the matter is the majority of the, of the syndromes are mixed phenotypes. So this is Claudio Rapetzi from Italy. He has this nice, you have each gene mutation and then you have a cardiac phenotype on the right, neurologic and then mixed. And the one mutation we see most commonly in the United States, is V122I. This means in the 127 amino acid monomer, at the, so in the 122nd position, instead of valine, you have isoleucine. And that mutation is found in 3.5% of African Americans, and it leads to late onset cardiac amyloidosis. Median age is around 68. And they tend to get minimal neuropathy, although the more we're studying these patients, the more we're seeing more have neuropathy than we used to think, but it tends to be mild neuropathy most of the time. 
The second most common in the United States is uh, threonine 60 alanine. Um, and this is seen, this comes from Northwest Ireland. Um, and so people are Irish descent. And I think in the UK, and obviously James is off the line, I think that's the most common one they see. So I'm not going to go into this. You already uh, talked about this, but we always look be for dissociation between the echo and the EKG. So even if you don't have low voltage, is the degree of thickening in the echo out of proportion to the voltage in the EKG? And remember with the EKG, this classic pattern of low voltage is only seen in about one quarter to one third of patients with ATTR. In fact, 10% of the patients meet LVH criteria and still have cardiac amyloid. And I'll show you an example of that, okay? So the, the, the endomyocardial biopsy is still the gold standard. And I will tell you, if you work up enough amyloid, you're still gonna need to do some biopsies because of the situation with the light chains and not knowing what's what. Okay, so we go right internal jugular approach. This is the H and E stain. This stuff here, this pink stuff, is the amyloid surrounding the myocytes. And when you apply Congo red stain and visualize under polarized microscopy, you get the apple green biofringin pattern. The biggest me mistake we see in pathology labs is the pathologist will say, oh, the patient is Congo red positive, they have cardiac amyloid, but that's not enough. You have to subtype the amyloid because pathologically you can use immunistic chemistry or the gold standard mass spec to then tell the clinician, is this AL? Is this TTR? Is this something else like, uh, you know, APOA1? So it's very important when in your pathology, when you talk to your pathologist at the gamma group to say, hey, you know, we need to make sure we have adequate subtyping of the amyloid in the myocardium. So the typical heart biopsy method, you know, you, you decide which one it is and you get the testing. But as you guys know already, you can get some blood test, simple blood testing and some imaging to arrive at the diagnosis. I think the majority of the time, um, probably, I don't know, 80% of the time, you can get away without a heart biopsy if you do the correct testing. Okay. And so this is the key. And you guys already know this because of the, the example you showed is that the serum and urine protein electrophoresis is not the correct screening test. In fact, this is so much imprinted in the minds of clinicians from medical school that they keep ordering this alone and they're missing the diagnosis of AL. SPEP and UPEP um, at least a third of the time can be negative, even with established AL. So these are the tests that you do, and these are the tests you ordered in the case report. And this is an example of a very abnormal uh, kappa lambda. And you can see that the lambda is much higher. And that's, you know, when it looks like that, that's easy. Unfortunately, it's not always like that. Um, I can tell you a lambda predominance is never normal. So um, if you have the lambda a little more than the kappa, particularly renal insufficiency, that's very abnormal. So remember that. Um, I'm not going to go over this. You guys already know this. And in the interest of time, um, dot, you know, amyloid was already mentioned by James. So I'm going to uh, move forward from that. Um, but the PYP scan, and this is the question you brought up. So this is DPD. In Europe, they use dipyrophosphate. And it's, it's actually prettier pictures than the one than the PYP we use in the United States. But here you can see, this is the example of grade three. And this is what spec CT looks like. So there's spec and there's spec CT. This is spec CT. You can see how well all the uptake is in the myocardium and none of it's in the blood pool. Okay. But the grading system that we use on planar is, you know, grade zero, grade one, grade two is equal to rib and grade three is more. And then you do the heart to contralateral ratio. And I didn't put anything about the heart to contralateral ratio, but remember if you image it one hour, the heart to contralateral ratio that was diagnostic was 1.5 or greater. Whereas if you image it three hours, which is what we do at the Cleveland Clinic, it's considered positive it's if it's greater than 1.3 uh, or 1.25. So the heart to contralateral ratio that you use depends on when you image the patient, whether it's one hour, which is 1.5 or three hours, which is typically around 1.3. Um, but, you know, from the qualitative standpoint, grade two or three is considered positive. Oh, here's the heart. This is the paper that showed the heart to control ratio of 1.5 out of Columbia. 
imaging at one hour. But anyway, so what's diagnostic of ATTR? So grade two or three, I put in number two confirmed by SPECT or SPECT CT, and I'll explain that in a minute. And you have to have normal free light chain ratio, no M protein. So, you, you know, so that's the important uh, feature of making the diagnosis. Now, this is an example of a grade three planar image. And you can see on the SPECT CT, it's all in the myocardium and it's diffuse, okay? Um, but what I wanna show you is an example of a false positive, okay? Here, you have grade two uh, PYP uptake, okay? And if you didn't do, if this was positive, grade two, and you had no light chains and no M protein, you'd say, oh, okay, this is, you know, TTR. But here you can see there's nothing in the myocardium. In fact, the color coding here is purple, and it's all in the blood pool due to low cardiac output. So this is a false positive scan, and this particular patient was prescribed an expensive medicine in Tefamidus for the wrong diagnosis. So that's why we are now advocating SPECT, or in this case, SPECT-CT, um, because of those cases that are intermediate where they're grade two, but they honestly, they could be just blood pool and you could be making the wrong diagnosis. And so that's where the idea of starting to mandate SPECT is. So let's conclude by saying, what's a reasonable diagnostic algorithm? So you have the clinical suspicion, the EKG, the echo, plus minus the MRI. And we talked about whether or not you always have to do a cardiac MRI. But anyway, so if you do the appropriate blood testing um, and you can also do the scan. Now you can do this first or you can do them at the same time. I do them at the same time if it's an older patient with a high pretest probability of ATTR. But if, the, if the, um, these are abnormal, then you can do a bone marrow biopsy next or a fat pad or the organ biopsy. But be very careful because there are patients with AL where you do the bone marrow and they have almost no plasma clone and they have no amyloid in the bone marrow. That doesn't mean they don't have AL. Um, you may have to go on and do a fat pad or more commonly a uh, biopsy of the affected organ. If the PYP is positive and I call the grade two or three and I put in parentheses spec confirmation because that's my opinion and the labs are normal for AL, then you've made the diagnosis and then the next step is the genetic testing. That's the way I approach the patient. I, if an MRI was already done or I wanna get an MRI for an undifferentiated patient, I will go ahead and do that. I'll get it for prognostic info. But if I'm already highly suspicious of the diagnosis, me personally, I will go directly to the PYP and the uh, AL labs, okay? And then if there's any question, you have to do a heart biopsy, okay? If this PYP is grade three, but you have abnormalities here, it still could be AL. And the number one take home point of this lecture is that AL can give you a positive PYP scan. In fact, in the seminal paper by Julian Gilmore and James Moon and those guys, multi-center, 22% of patients um, with AL amyloidosis had a grade two or grade three PYP scan, one in five, okay? So AL can give you a positive PYP. And so you can't just do the PYP alone and then assume it's TTR. You have to do a heart biopsy if both, if there's positivity here and an issue here, a lot of the times you have to do a heart biopsy to determine what the real type is. Um, the case that you presented, that mild abnormality here, I was very comfortable not pursuing that. And I'll show you an example. Uh, Carlos, do I have time to show a few examples? Do I have time to few, show a few examples? Yes, yes, uh, Mace. Okay, so okay. this is a 78-year-old African-American female with a history of hypertension and a mildly reduced ejection fraction of 45%. She's referred to me for shortness of breath with exertion. If you look at the electrocardiogram, actually she almost meets borderline criteria for LVH and AVL. It's certainly not low voltage by any means. It's normal. There's a PV couple PVCs. Here's her echocardiogram. You can see there's mild dilation um, 
and there's biventricular thickening and look at how severe the atrial dilatation is. And you get this sense that there's thickening of the intraatrial septum. So I was immediately concerned that this could be cardiac amyloidosis. So applying the algorithm that I outlined to this lady, she had normal serum free light chain and no M protein. Uh, when we did the scan, you can see she had grade three P, uh, PYP uptake confirmed in the myocardium by spec. And you can even see some RV uptake there. Okay. And when, so that combination is diagnostic of ATTR. So we made the diagnosis of ATTR non-invasively. And when we did the genetic testing, she came back positive for the V122I mutation that we see in African-Americans. And so this lady was non-invasively diagnosed with hereditary transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. Now this is a 61 year old white female, shortness of breath and lower extremity edema for a year and massive proteinuria, nine grams of protein in, in 24 hours. Okay, so immediately the combination of heart failure and nephrotic syndrome should make you think of AL amyloidosis. Here's her electrocardiogram. This lady is otherwise healthy, but you can see that she has a first degree AV block, a left anterior hemi block. She actually has Q waves in V1 and V2. Um, and her voltage is not classic low voltage, but you'll, you're gonna see when you see her thickness, it's gonna be out of proportion. So this is a small lady, you know, normal wall thickness for a lady would be maybe 0.8 centimeters. Here she has 1.3 septum and 1.0 posterior wall. So even though that you and I look at that and we say, oh, that's nothing, that's probably thick for this lady. And she has grade three, uh, very high E, small a restrictive filling pattern. And her NT pro BNP was 3,500. Here's her echocardiogram. Uh, you can see that she's got uh, a, a left pleural fusion, um, you know, some diffuse thickening. Uh, her global longitudinal strain was low at negative 10.5 with classical apical sparing. So let's apply the algorithm to this lady. So the first thing we did was we did the labs and look at the kappa. It's 312 compared to 23, very, very abnormal. Even though there's no M protein, the clinical suspicion of AL is there and then you have this abnormality. We didn't do a PYP scan here. There's no reason to do a PYP scan here. The next step is you're gonna either go after the heart or the kidney or go for the bone marrow um, to make the diagnosis. So this is a, a great example. Uh, you know, Although the kidney biopsy showed kappa light chain amyloid, the bone marrow only showed 1% plasma cells and Congo red negative. So if you just did the bone marrow and you saw that and you stopped, that would be a very bad mistake. This lady had kappa light chain amyloid with biopsy proven kidney involvement and clinical cardiac involvement. And uh, to make a long story short, she had a heart kidney by uh, transplant that's doing fantastic. Okay, last case, 81 year old white male, history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal stenosis, and a history of biceps tendon rupture. He was diagnosed with HEFPEF and AFib. He has mild dysphastic syndrome with platelets in the 60s. He's on metoprolol and warfarin, and that's his blood pressure. Here's his electrocardiogram. This is left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. So, you know, you would think that maybe this guy has hypertensive heart disease, but if you look at the wall thickness, it's 1.6, um, which is a little bit out of proportion, and he has a um, pericardial fusion. And remember, he had carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal stenosis, biceps tendon rupture. So if you look at his apical four chamber, you see biatrial dilatation. Um, and, you know, hypertensive heart disease doesn't give you biatrial dilatation like this. So everything is saying, okay, the EKG shows LVH, he has hypertension, but this is more likely cardiac amyloid. So here's his apical sparing pattern, which is very characteristic. So what did we find here? This is very like the case you presented. He, the, it's not a normal ratio, but it's very mildly abnormal. And he did have some renal insufficiency. He had no M protein. And here he has grade, grade three confirmed very much by spec. And so the question is, and he had negative genetic testing. So is this wild type TTR? My answer is yes. 
I feel comfortable that this light chain elevation of the ratio kappa predominant and real is is nothing okay and there's no m protein and so i'm comfortable calling this wild type uh, ttr so i mean that's the uh examples i wanted to give you and i don't know again i have some slides on therapy but again i don't know what the uh the time is do what why don't i stop there and take some questions and then if you want me to go over therapy for five to ten minutes i'm happy to do it Okay, uh, Juan Pablo and Alejandro, do you have any questions to me? Sorry to interrupt. Yes. May I, may I ask a question? Yes, Adrián. Hello, Adrian. everyone. Yes. I'm. Can you hear me? Yes, Adrián. Okay. Congratulations, Carlos, for organizing this excellent meeting. Good morning, Macy, Diego, Alejandro, Juan Pablo, Federico. Juan Manuel and those who are participating in the discussion of this clinical case. I have a question for the panel and especially for Mason. One of the problems that we cardiologists face is that we usually make a diagnosis of amyloidosis in, in very advanced stages. And as in the case of the patients presented today, there is little that we can offer with specific therapies. But in the case that we make an early diagnosis, either in the form of familiar amyloidosis by genetic screening or early diagnosis on wild-type amyloidosis by clinical suspicion, or for example, in the context of image screening in a population undergoing carpal tunnel surgery. What are the criteria of early cardiac involvement that we should use to initiate a specific therapy for amyloidosis? Adrian, thanks for your question, and uh, I still listen to your mixtape. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I wanted to uh, kind of mention it. So the question you're asking, maybe, for example, let me use carpal tunnel as an example. So we started doing at the Cleveland Clinic uh, after the study we published, active ascertainment protocol in patients undergoing carpal tunnel surgery. So any male over the age of 50 or female over the age of 60 um, who has bilateral symptoms or other red flags, we, we, the hand surgeon will, we have four hand surgeons who have agreed to do this. They will take a tissue, a, a sample of the tina synovium, you know, where, the, uh, where they're working and they'll send it for Congo red staining and pathology. And if that comes back positive and it's, we try to type it with mass spec, let's say it's TTR, then we say, okay, this patient has TTR in their carpal tunnel. Let's screen them for cardiac involvement, even if they're asymptomatic. So what we do is we do NT pro and troponin. We do prealbumin, which is the TTR level. We do an EKG, echo with strain, and a PYP scan. And we look at the data, and then we try to say, does this patient have early cardiac involvement or not? If I see... Um, obviously grade two or three uptake on a PYP as supported by any issues with the echo or EKG or biomarkers, um, but mainly the PYP, then I can justify starting somebody on tefamidus to prevent um, symptomatic cardiac progression. Now, the insurance so far hasn't given us trouble, interestingly. Um, technically speaking, it's not approved for an asymptomatic patient. Um, but we've had several people that we've identified very early and we've given them tefaminous or diflunosol, which by the way, works like tefaminous and it's a non-steroidal. And we feel like we're doing them a service because we're picking them up early and we don't think that they're gonna progress to symptomatic AFib or heart failure. Um, that's one um, situation. Now, what if the PYP is negative or grade one is there a more sophisticated way to determine if they have early disease? I mean, you could do an MRI. We had one guy, he was in his 60s, early 60s, positive uh, carpal tunnel TTR. Um, T PYP was negative, but the MRI showed some interesting late gadolinium enhancement areas, subendocardial patchy. We did a biopsy and he had TTR in the heart already. Um, so it, nobody really knows what's the best modality 
you know, there's a, a scan called Thorbetapir scan, which we think is even more sensitive than the PYP. So, you know, how early do you want to diagnose these people and how cost effective is it to start something like Defamatis? I don't really know, but I agree with you, Adrienne, that the problem is by the time we diagnose them and the wall thickness is 1.8 centimeters, you know, it, it's, it's far advanced and we don't really have any ways to remove the fibrils. Uh, other places, another place for you guys to really try to diagnose them early is in the EP lab. So your electrophysiologists see all these people with AFib, these older people. And if they're now our electrophysiologists, they're very keen on thinking about amyloid. So even at a wall thickness of 1.3, they see an older person coming with AFib, they'll reach out to me and say, hey, maybe this guy has amyloid. You know, they'll look at the EKG, they'll look for heart block or, or history of pacemaker. Um, so I think that, you know, we've been more aggressive at trying to diagnose it earlier, um, which I agree with you, Adrienne, is the next phase. Okay, Juan, Juan Pablo and Alejandro, do you have any questions? No, and no, ahora, not, not right now. I think, I don't know about you, uh, Juan Pablo. Um, uh, I think that your case were very interesting. Uh, uh, maybe question about the, the third, the, the last case that you mentioned, when you, when your level of light change were slightly high, I was wondering if you, if you, you were concerned about performing a, a bone biopsy just to exclude the possibility of, of light change. That's a great question. So I, you know, I think if you do a bone marrow biopsy in that situation, and there's no plasma clone whatsoever, it makes you feel better. Uh, and actually, in some cases, we'll do that. You know, it depends. It's not a systematic thing. Uh, I think if the ratio was 2.5, I might do the bone marrow biopsy or even a heart biopsy, um, depending on this. You know, each case is different. Like that guy had platelets in the 60s. He had myelodysplastic syndrome. I don't want to biopsy him. And so I wouldn't have done a heart biopsy for sure. I think the, the, when to do a bone marrow biopsy to kind of put that to rest um, is really a case by case basis. But I, I think that's a great question. And a lot of uh, amyloid experts will go ahead and do that just to make sure. I think in that case with the 1.8 and everything else, he had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal stenosis, biceps tendon rupture. He was, you know, uh, 80 years old. I, that was enough for me not to do the bone marrow biopsy, but I think there's some cases where I think that's very reasonable to do. That's a great question, actually. Uh, um, the, the second commentary I would say, um, I, I, I follow up a, a patient that nowadays he is a 74 year old and you, you and I met um, seven years ago. Yeah. Before, before Tafamidis was approved and he was looking for any kind of new therapeutics and um, taking into account what Adrian said, I, I, I think that this patient is still alive. This patient is still in, in functional class two. He swims, his ejection fraction is, is around 40. And it's all uh, related to giving her a treatment uh, at, the, at the early stage. So I, I think that if cause wasn't an issue, we should try to treat this patient in, in early stage. I 100% agree. And I want to just show you something. Um, by the way, before I forget, uh, these are some pictures from my trip to Rosario uh, from 2015. So that's very important to show you that I uh, loved your mocheca. Uh, but anyway, I want to show you something about um, treatment. Um, right here. Okay. So one, uh, Pablo, to your, to your credit, to your point, um, I think treatment is very important. And what I wanted to show was the different, uh, kind of aspects of treatment. So you have the liver is producing the, the, the messenger RNA is translating the protein. And then you have the tetramer, it breaks apart in the middle, this dimer dimer interface. And then, then it goes on to form the folded monomers and then the fibril. So the approach of blocking protein synthesis 
with Batisaran and Inotirsin. This is IV every three weeks, Batisaran. Inotirsin is a weekly injection. Unfortunately, that was shown to be actually quite beneficial. It's like treating AL amyloidosis where you knock down the bone marrow production of the light chain. Here you're knock downing the liver production of the TTR protein. But it's only approved in the hereditary form in patients with neuropathy. Now, stabilization therapy, this is just a cartoon showing that the thyroxin binding site is where diphenosol, the famitis, and AG10. AG10 works a little bit different spot. That's what they do is they stabilize the protein. And what I'm going to show you here is this is the tetramer, okay? Remember, there's four 127 amino acid monomers, and they come together at this interface, okay? And what tefaminus does and diflunosol does is they bind their small molecules that mimic thyroxin. They act like thyroxin. They bind, and they stabilize the tetramer, okay? And so what people forget is that diflunosol, which is a cheap, it's relatively cheaper, obviously, than tefaminus. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that was studied in patients with the hereditary form of neuropathy, and it showed delayed progression. And there's now several studies, retrospective, obviously, not controlled, that in cardiomyopathy patients, it can have a survival benefit. And we published a paper showing that in the majority of patients, particularly if their renal function is not bad, if, if they're not too elderly with a lot of heart failure, that they can tolerate it. So I think it's a good drug to use in the early diagnosis if you can't afford tefamidus because people forget that this drug does stabilize. So, and, and just to, 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 to make a comment about the tefamidus is the survival separation in the study was at 18 months. So if you have an advanced class three or class four patient, the likelihood that you're gonna have an impact is quite much lower than it is in the early disease. And so far, we don't know if defaminus reverses, you know, we just think it um, slows, slows down the decline in the six minute walk and in the KCCQ. We are doing an MRI study in Cleveland where we're taking people with ECV and T1 and other studies at baseline and then giving them defaminus and then rechecking the MRI at 12 months to see if there's anybody who have regression but I think the regression is going to be more likely with the, um, the, the liver silencing agents because uh, there, there is some evidence and some sub-studies that when you knock down TTR, you can actually get potential regression in the heart. What we're about to start studying is combination therapy. So, you know, patisseran plus defamidus, inotirsin plus defam. Those studies are just starting um, to see if maybe – the combination can be more effective than, than one agent alone. But this guy that I met um, with you, Juan Pablo, uh, it's awesome that he's seven years and he's still able to be NYJ2 or even better and swimming and so on and so forth. And again, I 100% agree with you that, you know, early treatment is the key and, and you know, educating everybody, EP, uh, imaging, heart failure to be always thinking about amyloid and if this index the suspicion is high and you make the diagnosis early, that's, that's the most impact you're going to have. Thank you, Mace. Awesome. Awesome talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Juan Pablo and Alejandro or anybody has any questions for Mace? I would just like uh, to ask Mace, uh, what's your take on dosing uh, for tefamides? Great question. So in the tefamides study, okay, uh, let me go back to that. Okay, so this was the outline of the study, okay? You had these 441 patients, um, two to one to two randomization. So 176 patients got 80. 88 got 20, and then placebo, 177 got placebo. So, um, and then they took the pool to famitis, okay? And then they looked at against placebo. And then they also did an extension study. And in the extension study, people on placebo, they got moved to either 20 or 80 of the famitis. And then ultimately everyone got onto 80. So the question is, 
was there enough of a comparison between the 80 and the 20 group? Okay. And, um, you know, that, that there is already the, uh, uh, at the, you know, they're already kind of, uh, presented some data on this, but it's not, the publication is not out. So I can't speak too much, mm -hmm. but, but there is a signal that the 80, um, you know, has a better impact on the NT pro BNP than the 20. Um, and, um, so, you know, if, and, and you get greater stabilization of the tetramer with 80. So the, the company obviously is pushing every to, everybody to be on 80. Um, but if you look at the 20 milligram dose in the trial, it was also effective. Um, so the way I look at it is I personally would like to give my patient the most 80. Okay. And now they have a tablet that's, it's one tablet, it's called 61 milligrams, but it's technically 80. Um, or you can take four 20 milligram tablets to equal 80. One's called Vindamax, one's called Vindicel. Um, but in patients who can't afford it, you'll hear like Matt Maurer or some other people say, okay, they wink at the patient and they say, take 40. I'm going to give you a prescription for 80, but take 40 because we still think 40 will be effective um, or even 20, but it's going to last you longer for the price. Also, some people get loose stools and diarrhea that may be related to famitis, which will respond to dose reduction. So the answer to your question about dose is I prefer to give 80 if they have loose stools or some diarrhea or they can't tolerate it, I'll cut it down to 40 or 20 if I need to. And if they cannot afford it and I can save them money and give them, you know, give them a prescription for 80, but tell them to take half of it. So it lasts twice as long. I'll do that sometimes as well. Um, May, so just, just one comment in, in line with what you, you just, just said in, in the recent European herd um, meeting, uh, they, they, they showed the results, uh, pulling together the, the result of a track and the extension. And it seems to be what, what Alexander said, um, um, a benefit of, of around 30% reduction in mortality with 61 milligrams. But the, I, I think it's, 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 it's reasonable to, found, to find that, that result because the, the stabilization is higher with 61 that with 20, but if the patient is not able to, to reach the 61 or the 80 milligram dose, I think that 20, 20 milligrams would be okay, would be something for him. I agree. I agree. And you know, I wasn't, a, I couldn't remember 100% sure if that combination of the trial with the extension was presented. I didn't want to misspeak and, you know, screw up. Pfizer, but I'm glad it was presented. Yeah, no, and I, Juan Pablo, I agree with you 100%. If 20 is better than nothing, 80 is the best, in my opinion, based on the totality of the data. Um, and there's some evidence that patients with the hereditary version, they need higher doses to uh, stabilize. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, the ideal scenario would be to individualize it. If you had a stabilization assay, which we do, and, and Jeff Kelly, who invented tefaminus, he, he can measure this TTR stabilization. So you could take a patient, put them on 20, 40, 60, 80, and see where they're maximally stabilized. Um, and that would be individualized. But yeah, no, I might, again, just to conclude and, and completely agree with you Juan Pablo is that um, 80, I think is the best or 61, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, but 20 is still okay if, if that's all you can do. Okay, thank you, Mace. Well, we are going to wrap up. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for being with us today. It was a great pleasure. And gracias, este, Alejandro, Juan Pablo, y... ¿Escucha? Federico. Sí, sí, sí. No, gracias a ustedes por la organización. A Federico, bueno. La invitación. Está Gustavo, también a Beliano, Adrián. Bueno, gracias a todos por la participación. Y bueno... Creo que hemos aprendido todos mucho y realmente hemos compartido este, un poco la experiencia personal de cada centro en el manejo de esta enfermedad. Thank you, Mays. Saludos. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias.